<laughs> so we are going to form a kind of like matrix to this particular <coughs> program next year. And um, our first idea is that all collectors are explorers. And we chose this particular stamp because philatelists know better than most that when you are looking for something, sometimes you have to purchase it. And um, this is this image came to mind when we were asked to do a presentation at Grompex, and we decided to select all the three cent commemoratives, sole commemoratives in 1932 and 1956 or 7, which featured Western themes. And this was our favorite of them the guest and purchase featuring the Saguaro, the ox cart, the map, and the pioneers. And it seemed to exemplify all that we, at least in the 50s and 40s, used to think of as our Western, our Western idea. So our overarching idea is the idea of postal reform as broadly based as possible. Um, this, that it's more than postage stamps, that everybody who collects postage stamps, either U.S. or GB, um, could do a lot of research into particular problems at various points where postal reform, if you like, started and had several iterations. Even, for instance, in this advertisement at the top, it was a heading for a petition, you can see all the various reforms that were imagined that didn't happen in 1840 in GB, and it didn't happen in 18. 45 or 47 here in the United States. Philatelists think of postal reform as their subject, but when uh, examining the, the historical materials, stamps were an afterthought. And if we, uh, if we wish to make a more profound examination of the postal system and its reformation, we need some other microscopes than merely our philately. And perhaps to uh, uh, acquaint ourselves with such, some of these other tools are perhaps the Potential interest for flowers that these tools may like to uh, engage for us. So the following are going to be what we have noticed are sort of no game-changing nodes for the postal system and sort of in chronological order. And also to think not just of the game-changing moments in the United States postal system, but in a perhaps a comparative mode. Between Great Britain. Compared to the past, we will be able to find out more about what we are if we see ourselves distinctly. So, here's the first <clears throat> that uh, the Great Britain Post Office of 1635 and visualized as a tree. So, this first idea of the postal system. It's designed in terms of the rows and the schedules. Um, here's another note that uh, prior, there was prepayment as early as 1680 um, in the greater London area um, under a man called William Dockra. And the Dockra Pen Post uh, in, inaugurated a, an entirely different design and postal organization distinct from the tree. This is the district and it served London locally and was centered <coughs> Patented on behalf of the British Postal System, incorporated in the design of the Postal Service. And uh, moving to our territory here, definitely a known was the Act of Queen Anne in 1711, and that's the first time that a postal road and a designated schedule was advertised, and this was the first printing of that on a map in 17. Newspapers have come into uh, prominence of Phil Tully terms, thanks to Ron Sipola. The, uh, but we didn't appreciate, or haven't yet appreciated, the newspapers were prepaid as early as 1800 in this quarter, in this country, prepaid quarterly in advance. And that means, means the advantage of the revenue accruing from newspapers was collected at the office of their delivery, prepaid. Mail, miles of mail transportation distinct from uh, the miles of 
Postal Road. Uh, miles of rail transportation is a combination of the miles of the Postal Road times the time uh, combined with the frequency of the rails upon those roads and a very important transformation occurred in 1832 when with the miles of the Postal Road almost constant, postal service was increased by 50% merely by changing the frequency of the service. You see that little gap at the Civil War? Uh, that was the loss of all of the routes in the south, which were very low frequency routes typically, and the average uh, performance of the, uh, the average miles of mail transportation in the rest of the country uh, increased dramatically during the war. And here is the dude that reorganized everything and um, essentially established the postal system as we know it. One of the things putting, um, and that's very interesting, but that particular image did not come out. Hmm. Well, all it was was the front of the Treasury Department. The, the idea was uh, Amos Kendall, Postmaster General, was given to reorganize the Post Office Department. He was not the technical man behind that problem. That was Sal Hobby, who uh, will rise in our estimation, I hope, <coughs> as we go through our course. But in addition to the Treasury Department um, overseeing the finances of the Post Office Department, in 1836, all of these great annual reporting started to be published that we can now use to get statistics on all sorts of things, revenue and miles of transportation. Jumping ahead to 1900, the, the postal system has transformed the country. Here is a uh, sort of a, a density map of the transport of the mail in 1900. You see huge quantities of postal matter originating on the east coast and dwindling uh, uh, in the trickle of trickles as far as, we, as, far as uh, further west we go. Uh, the idea is the postal system creates channels of organization in which the country falls. And there are three nodes, if you like, the 1838, when railroads are the first post routes, um, 1845, which, you know, if you're thinking in old postal reform terms, um, but the biggest thing about the 1845 reforms was that um, the railroads were going to be compensated by weight and not by miles, and that meant that there could be just, just, the, the, just the opposite. Not, sorry, just the opposite. Mail transportation was not by weight. That's a very important uh, fundamental issue that we will dis discern and find out what that means in terms of economies of scale and the development of what in the United States was later understood to be the law of transportation permitting densities, uh, uh, economies of scale according to the densities. So just as an individual letter is no longer marked <coughs> by its weight or numbers of pieces of paper um, and was under a uniform weight, so was the whole of the mail carried. And then, of course, the note of 1900 um, with this particular report that showed um, all the weights. The, this, this captures the data from a comprehensive mail weighing that occurred at that time. 1848, um, essential if you're going to compare the two systems, was the Postal Treaty with Great Britain. And here's a lot of Hobie cropping up as a, the first assistant postmaster general. He actually went to Europe to explore all possible treaties, um, with specifically with Germany and or the German states and with Great Britain. The Travis papers capture a lot of the Hobie reports, which are very important to us. He is the technocrat on the ground. The, uh, the diplomats and postmasters general and the other people, the reformers and so forth, know little about the workings of the postal system. Hobie tells us a lot. Hey, here are some multiple modes. Another image that didn't cross up. Hmm. Okay, so the, all that showed was the postal savings. Uh, window at a post office. But here, um, when you think of money in the mail and the role that the post office department played with banking, um, registry is very important, 1855, money order is very important, 1864, and then postal savings system, which didn't last long, but was pretty critical 
in. Um, we, we shall certainly uh, go back even further to understand the private express movement, which arose in the late 1830s, as principally members uh, serving the banking community. The, the failure to renew the charter for the U.S. Bank meant that their exchanges had to occur in a much different fashion than private express movement rose to serve those uh, needs and, uh, and uh, give the postal, the great problems from the postal system. Oh. Here, here are some other pictures that don't come through. So, the, okay, this, not being a techie, I'll ask somebody why later on. The, the, this is why we do this a year in advance. <laughs> 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 those lovely pictures. Yeah, those lovely pictures. Which showed, of course, an RFD carrier in his horse, um, but it also showed a mailman um, from the 19th century. Uh, because mail delivery and the whole culture of mail delivery, specifically to one's address, um, is a, a couple of other very important notes that you might want to research. Now, who are we going to evolve in this? Uh, uh, this, uh, this virtual reality, bringing experts into our classroom. We, most of these gentlemen have already, with considerable lack of teeth, um, said yes to the opportunity. Actually, all but one. And this first gentleman um, may not be well enough to even do a live feed next year, but it would be wonderful if he could. Um, some of you know him, Tom Alexander. There's. Uh, some of the reasons why you might have met him before um, listed there. But we're particularly interested in the research that he did into what are called the Travers Papers um, and that were published in a massive two-volume, very expensive work. Um, I hope you all read that. <laughs> yeah, right. Can I just say, Tara Murray gave her general <coughs> session yesterday on all the different uh, collections like that, that uh, being the first one. So okay, those of you that were here might remember that from yesterday. Uh, we should mention, <clears throat> you're welcome at any point to ask questions. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you have any questions at this point or, or, or to go further uh, within the few moments remaining, please raise your hand and we will try to plug them into uh, whatever it is we decide to question. No questions yet. But what we're interested in with, with Tom's work is, you know, obviously he can tell us a little bit about the slog of it all through all these papers, but in terms of bringing um, a very sophisticated philatelist like Tom to such a research project, he, he actually purchased letters, for instance, from Salah Hopi that were then included in these volumes. So it isn't just the papers that Travers himself had saved. Um, Tom added things from his own collection. We must acknowledge that Tom uh, himself appreciates Salah Hopi, and I think one of the few philatelists who has done that so far. <laughs> Some of you have met this very engaging speaker, um, Richard John. Uh, his book, Spreading the News, which won awards both in the academic community and in the philatelic community for good reason. It is the best general history of the post office department in the United States. Um, but he also, he, he went on, his second book was about uh, telephony and uh, coming out of telegraphy. Um, and what I put there is, in the middle, is a description of this whopping great thing that he accomplished, a four-volume work reproducing printed works about the United States Post Office Department that were so rare as to be unavailable anywhere else. So China would win this published, now the world has, basic resource material in the U.S. postal system, our interest is going to be adding to presumably a worldwide uh, uh, interest in... Yes. It's actually Pickering and Chato, the other one. Oh, <laughs> that Chato women's must have been many years ago. Yeah, right. So. Women's died, Chato. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this is an extraordinary project 
to identify what these rarities were and why people would be interested in reading them. But practically the whole volume is given to post number four. And um, the reason we're so intimately connected with this is that he came and stayed at our house and ruffled through our whole library to find some of the rarities. Ruffled is the word. Yeah, he's an academic, not a librarian. Uh, but he's, as I said, very engaging speaker. He would not, because of his job right now at Columbia University, he wouldn't be able to come in person. Uh, but he's very keen to um, help anybody with research. These gentlemen will, will be our targets. We will want to create our sharpest questions in order to ask them appropriate questions. Okay. Richard, Richard Kilbowitz, um, his book, News in the Mail, was the best, still is the best, uh, book about the relationship between newspapers and the United States Post Office Department. Um, He's out in Seattle. It's unlikely we would be able to lure him here, except uh, through live video feed. Um, he's he's very active. If you if you Google him and find out his the description of what he's been doing, um, he has all sorts of paper. He hasn't published another book, but he has a lot of really good research work into various aspects of the post office. It looks as if he's been, and like Richard, often engaged as a consultant in postal matters, so he's developed very technical understandings of many aspects of the postal system. Tim O'Connor, uh, also a very engaging personality, uh, a philatelist, who has, in a very interesting way, he, he's, he's interested, first of all, in the earliest mail in the United States. Um, hence the earliest postal systems in North America. This paper that was included in the volume from Indian Trails to the Birds of a Nation, which was just recently published, it's the proceedings of a symposium that took place at Regis College last year. Um, he's, he thought, well, where am I going to find these earliest examples of mail? I'm going to buy everything I possibly can. He has been. And he has been. For the last 30 years. But where am I going to find these? And of course, the, easy, the obvious answer is in public um, institutional collections. And so that the one I'm showing you here, for instance, was found in Massachusetts Historical Society. Dick Winter has uh, spearheaded a project to use archives as resource materials for philatelic uh, uh, study. And uh, Tim O'Connor has taken that with respect to this subject into the colonial period, yielding vast flows of material, which greatly amplifies what we use to allow us uh, through our own collections by understanding these matters. He's a good example, too, of, um, you know, some people, for instance, Dick Winter would say, all right, I'm going to go to a particular archive, and I'm going to look through everything to see what's there. What Tim said was, okay, so which archive is most likely to have the earliest letter from Providence, Rhode Island? <clears throat> and then goes to the archive looking for that particular area. Um, that's just a different thing. Um, here are two gentlemen, and I think they might be familiar to many of you, Tom Lara and Dan Piazza, uh, both working at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. And the reason why they are key is that they have figured out how best to do research in Washington. That is, at the National Archives, at the Library of Congress, obviously at their own place, but they've worked out how you could do it most efficiently. In fact, they recommend that you go first to them and they will help you get your name tags and, and everything that you will need. Um, it's possible that Tom would, is not going to be available next year, but his wisdom would be. He's also the go-to person for um, research that demands uh, technical expertise. 
um, Dan Piazza, who has uh, taken over as head curator with Cheryl Gans's retirement, um, will definitely be in place. And it's possible that we might be able to get one of them here in person, but if we can't. Diane's mentioned Tom Lair with respect to uh, technical aspects. Tom is a driving force between, behind the Institute of Analytics for that and uh, sits astride the, the memory machines, but with his brief had a little bit of experience too. Oh dear. Now, uh, there's well. a hot film, this picture not showing up, but you know <laughs> David, he, he, he talked at dinner several years ago. But that, no, that, but that was at a Postal History Symposium. It was? Yes. It wasn't here. Well, it was here in Belfort. Okay, it was but, here in Belfort. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me describe what he looks like. First of all, he's younger than we are, which is great. Um, and he's he partially is, bald and bald. Yeah, well, you know, male pattern baldness. It's early. Um, he's he's a, a very um, personable guy. And his key interest is in money and how it's flowed and how it, it its relationship to the post office, um, and in his case also to telegraphy, his book was on the telegraph in America. And he's he's a professor right now and at SUNY Albany. He's um, keen to have research students take on projects that some of you might come up with, which is nice too. I mean, it's like, People joke, everybody needs a wife, especially women who work need a wife. Um, everybody needs a good research assistant. Graduate students. Graduate students. So he might be able to supply us with graduate students. This is our contact and uh, of several whom we will access for the uh, compare and contrast our postal culture with that of Great Britain. Um, <clears throat> yes, James. Uh, has Grimwood Taylor. He, he wrote the, uh, a series of articles in the American Philatelist perhaps 20 years ago on postal reform. And it's primarily due to him that we, uh, we, we know that the, that the, post, the idea of the postal stamp was an afterthought. <coughs> or at least uh, we, uh, he said that boldly and out front in a philatelic publication. Even though we tend, as philatelists, to think of it as our uh, to place, place our pursuit of uh, important postal materials um, uh, somehow a little bit beyond our reach and something we can grasp for and get here for these videos. James also was very early in um, interested in contrasting uh, what was going on in Great Britain and what was going on in the United States and doing research in both countries uh, to produce a book which is so difficult to find. There is not one available for sale, for instance, right this minute. Um, but it's a book on postal reform. I think it's here in the library. I'm going to check. But the American Philatelist articles, I believe, are increasing. Yeah. And the Post in Scotland, another book I haven't seen, and uh, Amazon assures me that that particular image is not what the book looks like. Uh, but it was, it continues to be the go-to book. And the image that didn't show up <coughs> is the earliest known letter uh, from Scottish Island. Now, John Scott might be able to come in person. Uh, he would like to, if possible. He's an extraordinary philatelist. Um, as you can see, all the various ways in which he's linked in to philatelic research in, um, in the various libraries in London. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Claire, run a business called History Store, which mostly now deals in um, various things that are, are reproduced from Victorian images. Uh, Claire next year will be both president and of the Postal History Society in Great Britain and editor of their journal. So it would be great if we could have both of them here. Um, and they said that they are up for that possibility of spending a little bit of June in Western Pennsylvania or Central. Um, 
Um, but he's also uh, keen because of all of these connections with libraries in London, he would be the go-to guy if he wanted to do research in England. And he would be, he has said he'd be happy to you know, handhold anybody through all of these. Oh, shucks. Well, <laughs> huh. Wait, oh, that's a quick time, right? Which I have, and you go. Yeah, so you did it on a machine that had quick, like a map, maybe? Yeah, like a map, maybe. Um, okay. Oh, well. Uh, so, Frank Shear is, um, uh, he would even say this, amongst many other things, he's a railroad maniac. And he, he's one of those collectors who decided early that he wasn't just going to form a collection, he was going to form a museum and a research library, which he did in his own home for many years, and that's what we saw, but he was able to buy a decommissioned railroad depot, which image of which you cannot see, but you can online. It's a lovely building, huge. Um, in the D.C. area, and uh, he's definitely the person you would want to talk with if you had any interest in, interest in railway mail. And he's very keen to be part of this project. And, oh, darn! The oh. wonderful thing about this picture is it's a young dude there. Oh, this is a really this young is a, dude. This is a graduate student. Yeah. He's, and his PhD work is on the post office. The great thing about Cameron is that he's really techno savvy. And his idea is that all of this, all of the work that he's doing for his PhD, he's putting up online with interactive maps of the postal system. And so all of you have any interest in the geography of the post office, this is, this is the place you should go. Google, just Google his name and you start getting it all. Um, because he's also part of a project at Stanford um, to get as much of research in general up online and, and how to do it in a format that can be easily used by any computer, quick time or not. <clears throat> and I, what I put up there was just a little snippet of, of some of the things, the, uh, the data base that you can just click on to. Um, and although we will not probably do a video feed with another man called Michael O'Reilly, we definitely will be talking about his work, which isn't yet available online. But his, <clears throat> his idea and Cameron and he are working together um, is to get all of the data from the official registers available, um, which is a huge project, and will be very useful. So Cameron is our, our youngest dude and very keen to be part of this. He hasn't worked with collectors yet and would be excited to do so. So I think that was the last one. Yep. It is. Our, our intention is begin, has begun to continue to map this course, to map our interaction with these gentlemen as a uh, function of the curriculum that we're going to choose, uh, hoping that we will be able to have enough time to involve them all in all the subjects uh, that we uh, imagine that they might be able to contribute to, as so far as they may be interested in using philosophy and also historians. So, one of the things that we would like to do in the intervening year is to hear from anybody who's interested in this idea and to help shape a project that you might like to carry into this. I mean, you don't have to have one. You can just, you know, listen to these people talk about how they do research and ask the questions. But I think it would probably mean that you would get more out of the course if you had a specific project in mind. And we would be happy to help in the intervening year um, shape that project. Thank you.
And as you know, we're editors. We would also be happy to um, think in terms of shaping it towards publication. But even if it's just to add something to your own collection um, in terms of research, I think it would be a lot of fun. Keith. I like to be the first to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what this ties into? The, uh, the original act is 1794, yeah. like I have. And by the way, a copy of it is coming up a week from tomorrow at the Siegel auction. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's minus the last page. I went and took a look at, look at it last week. The last where it says week. deposited in the rolls of the Secretary of State. Right. This is the copy he has, he has for sale. But he does mention that it's extraordinarily rare yeah. and an important uh, philatelic document. But the point being that that was the first act that made permanent, and Scott Trumple, being such a great scholar himself, he, he does a wonderful catalog. Yes, he does. And in there, he did, says that, that this act made permanent the, uh, the establishment of the post office in the United States. And the interesting thing about the argument that occurred before then, that it had, it had to be made a permanent for 1794, whereas the country had come into existence in 1789. And the point being, the argument that Washington had, that he refused to give in on, that all newspapers had to go free, because it was yeah. so important for the American people to be educated. So our early leaders understood it, now present leaders don't. Mm. That particular thing. So to actually look at you know, those arguments, and to say one of the major reforms was actually in 1794, when it was made permanent, that they were going to charge at least a little bit, because they recognized that the greatest volume of the mail that was going to be produced in the early years of the Republic were going to be newspapers. So they couldn't afford to have a system where they didn't charge anything. Nowadays, our country is one that discourages the circulation of magazines, you know, because it becomes so expensive. <coughs> so well, the that should be. Right, and so yes, both Richard John, Richard Kubowitz would certainly talk to that, but also uh, David Hochfelder, because of the idea of, of what you pay for and what comes free is certainly something he's very interested in. Uh, yes. Is the Pony Express going to be included in this? Well, the Pony Express, uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, why not? I mean, we're just, that was not a no in our terms because it was, it was primarily there for the, because of the telegraph mm -hmm. one thing, and because it lasted such a short period of time and it didn't lead to anything. It just, you know, brought together the two ends of the, system. Um, but as a topic, I mean, why not? That it certainly is part of the American postal culture. Right. Uh, it's how we, well, what we think of, so we think of the American postal system, and we should remember that these, uh, that we are very distinct to that, that there is a culture. This culture varies from country to country. We're becoming more interested in those cultural differences helping us define and refine exactly what it is that we are referring to when we say postal. Yes. Um, as, as editors, you naturally, or naturally think in terms of the end result of research being publication, articles, books. Uh, I would urge you to add into that fine stew um, publication in the form of philatelic exhibits. Ah, yes, definitely. That's a, that's a, yes. that's a challenge, as a matter of fact, when it comes to uh, many of these subjects which we'll be uh, uh, touching upon. It defines some exhibitable way for philatelists to, uh, to, to grab on. Uh, and they might have to make, change the predilections of collectors uh, after all, a lot of people don't collect railroad mail cars or <laughs> mail bags, for example. How do you put them in an album? Uh, but the, the fact that, that the collection and, and archiving and uh, appreciation of these things is ultimately uh, part of what we are seeking uh, to include in our uh, understanding of the postal system. Yes? 
I was curious about the uh, timeline that you envision. Uh, it seems like most of these are sort of the formative stages of the Postal Service, but it seems to me that there are some critical nodes that occur much more recently uh, with a passion for modern postal history. It seems to me, for example, the whole concept of work sharing, the whole notion that there comes a point at which the Postal Service actually benefits by outsourcing and the pre-sort and the discounted postage and all that. Yes. And if Very you, lovely. And if we will be sensitive to such ideas. We will find them actually present in the formation formation of the postal system, which will be a great discovery. And we will not we will not avoid what we understand as the postal history of our lifetimes in this course. Although most of the subjects that we have mentioned uh, peter out by every uh, time mm -hmm. by, by the great war. But, and certainly, uh, David Hockfelder is particularly interested in the. The late 20th century. And, and, and uh, 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 this interest in the American postal system is, in, in its international terms, um, is a, a serious uh, study to enable people to understand what it was that postal systems meant and what they might still mean uh, with the question of how we serve, uh, how we serve postally and, uh, and, and what results from it. Uh, how to make sure we continue to have one? Yeah. Um, are you looking at foreign compensation or foreign compensation by right impact the American postal system? Yes. Well, this is the, the, the our principal co compare and contrast with the British experience. Only because our the experts. I saw the look at Scotland. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, both James Grimwood Taylor and John Scott are experts in, in Great Britain's postal history, but certainly. Um, there, many of the other people have to include an German, understanding of the German states and the Italians are very are very apt students of postal history, and we would wish to, and perhaps uh, according to the kinds of people who get involved in this course, we might have, have in house expertise in exploring further cultures in the Anglo American. For instance, we have, we ourselves have contacts with English speaking. Um, Postal historians in Italy, Denmark, France, Germany. and Germany. And so, if there were, you know, enough people signing up for the course who really wanted that, then we would contact one of those people, see if they're willing that they would be part of a boarding session, <laughs> given the time to. Would this be a question for you to ask Gretchen about the degree of interest in the audience present in uh, the materials of such a course? Yes, uh, we could easily do a survey and um, as students register for the course they can let us know or we can inquire of them what their particular interests are uh, so that we can communicate it with you. Yeah. Will this be a four day course or two? That's up to Gretchen. She's only four days away. I don't know how we'd get through it in two. <laughs> Good question. Because I, I understand from other of the live feed courses that you it's an hour slot with each person, is that true? That's very flexible. It is flexible. Yeah. We imagine to a bit. Karen. There, there seems to be a certain uh, geocentricity uh, to the framework you're uh, mentioning here uh, on, a, on a different axis uh, is, is methodology, research methodology. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that that particular axis will be uh, explored. explored. My, my particular interest uh, among many, the one is in getting a greater understanding of the diversity of research methodologies across different types of sources. Right, and that, I, sorry, I, I just sort of assumed that that would be part of all these different people, of course, they do research in completely different ways. I mean, you can see right away that Cameron Blevins is not researching the same way as Richard John. Um, Richard John is practically innumerate. I mean, he doesn't do statistics. And Cameron is particularly interested in statistical research. Um, and then 
the, the philatelists amongst the group are doing a, a different kind of looking through uh, archives. And yes, methodologies, I, what we assume is that um, in the live feed idea, that's what the people are going to, the particular person is going to talk about first, is what their research methodologies have been. and then respond to questions. I'd like to add that uh, we, we do quite a bit of pre-testing with these live feeds so that we make sure that there's not going to be any technical issues. For instance, this afternoon, we have Tony Vavakevich being fed in via the internet uh, for an elective. And he and I spent about 45 minutes last night making sure that everything would work properly. So uh, just wanted to let you all know that that, that will be in place. I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> very relieved. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Uh, you couldn't see it <clears throat> being a course less than four days, could you? Well, no, we originally said that, you know, if it was two days, we'd certainly be amenable. Couldn't do it, I think, in two days. Well, you wouldn't have as many people involved. No, if you're going to want to develop our own context for these feeds, these are just not entertainment moments. Uh, we will want to frame them uh, with our own conversations and, and sharpen our interests towards these particular voices that we will now then find to be resources for our curiosity and our, our, our and I think that's that's key that all of these people are willing to not just be there for an hour or the other side of a webcam they they are very willing to continue a relationship with philatelic researchers with collector researchers um, and they would like to be more in tune with the collecting Thank you.